One of the things that we were uh, hitting on a little bit just before we took a break was expectation, people's expectation, God's expectation. Sometimes in doing things, people predominantly call things wrong and look at them wrong if they don't understand it. When some things can be lawful, and what I mean by lawful, I don't mean by the law of the land. I'm, I'm talking about by the God's law, that there's liberties there, but people create these fence laws it's just like growing up in the religion I grew up with, was in, involved in. I, women literally, I don't want to use the word slaves because I, I don't want to sound like I'm putting down, but women literally had every uh, rule pressed upon them. You will do this. You will dress this way. You will not cut your hair. You will not wear makeup. You will not wear pants. You will not wear a bathing suit. You will not go dancing. You will not have a TV. You will not. I mean, you just go down the line of all of this different stuff. And here was one of the things that really got me in in being involved in that. I'd go over to my friends' houses, and I was completely dumbfounded and mesmerized because they had a TV. We didn't have a TV. That was one of their rules, and by God, we did not have televisions. That was just, you know, I don't think we really had a TV in the house till I was like 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. But we did, you were with me. We went to an organization. I I just remembered that. We (laughs) went to an organization, to a music conference. I won't name names, but, uh, and from the, am I lying when I say this? From the podium, and what, there's probably 500 people there, 400 people. They put out a decree that certain individuals would not be allowed on their stage because of their standards. And pretty much everybody turned around and looked at us because <laughs> you had long hair and a beard. I think my beard was about four inches yeah. longer than this, and that's a no-go for them. you know. But, yeah. and, and I will have to say this. Good for them for standing up for their standards. You know, I, you know. Y- you won't. I guess. I guess. I mean, you won't find that stuff in the Bible. But who needs the Bible anyways? The Bible's right. not important. We rewrite that every day. Right. Um, but yeah, that, I forgot about that. Uninvited us from coming up on their stage. Yeah, everybody's welcome. Uh, and by everybody, we mean uh, everybody. But but those two guys back there. Yeah. And you know, I don't want to hate on them, but it it I was like that too growing up. You know, if I saw a woman wearing pants, hell. If you were dancing, hell. If you had a TV, hell. Right. You know, if you had a sip of alcohol, you're going to hell. If you smoked a cigarette, you're going to hell. I mean, everything was about what you can't do. Everything was focused on. So getting or getting back to what we were talking about, then you get around somebody like that that calls everything under the law. But whose law? Everybody weighs it against religion, but not against the, the word of God. So here's my question. Is it wrong or are you just calling it wrong? And the hard part about human nature is sometimes when we have people calling things wrong, and here's a good example. Let's say I'm sitting there talking to a buddy, and I bring up uh, a guy named Chris's name. And they go, oh. And they start saying all the stuff Chris does wrong, and then people are sitting around and start thinking, well, Chris must be a bad guy. And Chris isn't doing anything wrong. He's just doing stuff that they wouldn't do. So, therefore, since they wouldn't do it, it's wrong. Right, right, right. That happens a lot. Yeah, it, it does. <clears throat> uh I I try to work with it because I know that ultimately you're not going to change people that don't want to be changed. So, you know, earlier we were talking about you may not allow your full guard down around everybody because they can't handle it, their level of maturity. And so, you know, the ideal is that everybody's mature and everybody moves past that mentality that you're describing, like where they have certain expectations and they all that kind of stuff. But I also am smart enough to know from a practical standpoint, do I want to help these people or not? And if I do or say something that's going to shut them down, then I ruin any opportunity that I have in the future of, of helping them see things from a different perspective or mature in the faith, mature in, in their knowledge of the word. And so, like, why, yes, all things are legal, all things are lawful, Paul says, but not all things are helpful. 
uh, not all things are expedient. So like if the, what's your mission, what's your objective? If it is to just do whatever you want and say, you know, whatever, just be dismissive of others who are critical, then okay. Then yeah, fine. You have that right to do that. But I think, I think as mature, uh, again, air quotes around leaders in the faith, uh, or in, in ministry, whatever, we have to say, can we set aside some of our liberties, some of our rights to help them and pull them to a different way so that we don't discredit ourselves in their eyes before we have a chance to even do some good? Now, you don't have to stay that at that level forever. If they have no willingness or no ability to move ahead and to see things from a more mature standpoint, then yeah, it's not like we have to change our entire lives and always walk on our tiptoes or eggshells or whatever that saying is around them because that becomes inauthentic and that becomes counterproductive. But at our first appearance, yeah, I, I don't I don't always let people see every side of Sean that there is because then they would never see. I think it's smart. I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, that's intelligent. I, I try. I mean, anyway, you know, I try to focus on mission and accomplish the objective and in talking with people when you when you get a bunch of different uh, heads together thoughts and opinions i think a sign of intelligence at least for me i'll come back to the intelligent part because that's not very becoming of me um whenever i am praying i'm reading my word i'm being mindful Everything becomes less about people and more about me and my standing with God. When I am not focused, it becomes more about people and what they're doing and way less about God. Mm -hmm. And whenever you get that balance of realizing the human frailty, human nature, the you said at the beginning, knowing your limitations, knowing your humanity, when you get all that factoring in, and what is that old saying that when God came up with his plan, he already factored in my stupidity or okay. something like that. And when you can get all the voices removed out of your life and you can become intelligent enough to look at yourself and say, this is who I am. This is me when I'm angry. This is me when I'm happy. This is me when I'm sad. This is me when I'm complacent. And you really start internalizing who you are. I think that's in, in, in the whole world. Let's take the church out of the realm right here. There are a lot of people walking around who don't know who they are. Right. They don't know who they I are. And, and like I was talking with somebody and got, maybe got a little heated, but I said, uh, are you more than just a job or is your job your identity? Is your job who you are? Do you have an identity outside of sure. work? And there's a lot of people that walk around, well, I'm a plumber and I'm an electrician. No, that's what you do to eat. That's what you do to maintain and live. That's not who you are. Right. That's what you do. And sometimes if, if, if we lose our identity and we don't know fully who we are, we're kind of like a, what, like a wave tossed in the ocean, just whatever the, the wind blows and puts us anywhere we're at. So once you once you get mindful and say, you know what? I'm going to start focusing on me. You really do start getting a lot more empathy towards people because then you start seeing your flaws, your frailty, right. and it, yes. it, 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 it allows you to have compassion towards people because you realize somebody's been putting that up with that from me. Yes. And that's the hard 100%. part. That's the hard part. I think from my own experience, and that's all I can speak from, like, I th I think the more the more I've matured, the more empathetic I've become, or vice versa. I'm not sure which which is first, but being able to appreciate, man, I'm I'm pretty messed up. I've had some really big mistakes in my life. Even when I thought I was doing well, it gives compassion and like it gives a lot of grace. The one who's been forgiven much loves much. Jesus said. And that is obviously, Jesus said it, it's true, but I, I can attest to that from experience. I've, I've been forgiven and I have need of much forgiveness in my life. So why would I not want to give, extend that same grace to others? They're trying to, you know, they're trying to make it just like I am. And I think the sign of really of having God's heart, uh, 
whether you want to call that spiritual maturity or anointing or closeness or whatever, whatever label you want to put on it, I think it's compassion. I think fundamentally the sign of being close to God is having compassion. Uh, and the less we focus on ourselves counterintuitively, like the more we focus on others and trying to help and try to do for them, the less time we have to navel gaze and become obsessed and narcissistic, all the things that our culture is these days. And I'm, I'm part of it. You know, I've had to really try to brainwash myself with the word, but like the less we focus on our own problems and try just help somebody fix theirs from the small to the great, like marriage problems or just going and painting their shed. I mean, whatever it is, just focus on somebody else for a dad gum second, get out of your own head, your own problems. And you, then you become to have the heart of God. That's where you get God's heart. He's compassionate to order towards others. He loves people. He wants to see them doing well. And then in the process, you bring healing to yourself. You bring maturity, you bring understanding, you bring grace. The one, I mean, we reap what we sow, right? The one who forgives much, loves much. And I think that it's, you know, I just keep using that word counterintuitive. Like, help others and you help yourself. I I will promise you that there will be a tons of tons of people in agreement with this. Learning how to receive help can be just as big of a battle as learning how to give help. Sometimes people don't know how to receive a blessing. I agree. People don't know how to, and I don't want to say it's that they're too proud, but sometimes it's hard. It's just like when somebody play, pays you a compliment sometimes and people don't, you know, they're like, oh, okay, you know. Sometimes it's hard to receive that. Yes. And we have to learn to let people help us. Right. And when we when we take the, the word help, help sometimes – when somebody says, Hey, I need help. What is that help? Is it financial help? Is it, you need me to physically move something with you? Or are you coming to me from an emotional standpoint? Like you're just needing to vent. You're needing to talk. You're seeking some direction. Like, Hey, what do you think? Let me bounce this off you. Sure. It's hard. It's hard to sit there and let somebody come into your life and you kind of hand the reins over for a second and let them, you know, kind of take a charge in your life. You know what I think the root cause of that is pride. Oh, yeah. Because we don't want to admit that we don't have it figured out. It goes back to that same thing we were talking about, like the, the expectation of perfection have to be Superman, Superwoman, especially in a spiritual setting. But I think it's it's man's foolish pride. And I've had, God, I've had more than my share of that in my life. And we don't, we can't accept help because then it, it, we have to admit that we need help. Right. And then we're not perfect. We don't have it all together and we can't. And then our entire facade that we've constructed for the world comes crumbling down. And then you have to admit not just to others, but more difficult, more importantly and more difficult is admit to yourself. I'm pretty messed up. Yeah. (laughs) I I don't have it figured out. This whole thing that I've created, this whole construct in my life. You know, you mentioned identity. People are searching for identity and we base it on the most like fleeting, transitory, insignificant things. Well, I'm a Houston Astros fan. Well, I'm a Texas Rangers fan. And they base their entire identity on it. Or, you know, in a more serious note, their their work or their relationship or their, you know, job titles or whatever. And people are searching for identity because they can't accept we have, we, not they, we have such prideful notions built up of expectations of perfection. And accepting help, to your point, it comes, it shatters that whole myth that we've created, the the whole narrative of our life. It shatters it when, when we're forced to say, yeah, I do need help. So when we go to that and we talk about identity, when people who do not have a, a foundational um, grasp on who they are, what they are, who their God is, how he operates, when we see people that do not pursue what it is they're getting involved with. And what I mean by that is just like you become an Astros fan, probably go buy a hat then you probably buy a shirt, you know, and then maybe you'll get some tickets, go to the game. You'll, you know, there will be something showing. Maybe you fly a flag at your house. Baseball. They call the America's pastime. You know, everybody loves baseball. You know, it's as American as apple pie. It's pretty much been the exact same since its its foundation. 
there has been some changes that have been good, and there's been some changes in baseball that have have been kind of ridiculous. But the logist of it has stayed exactly the same. The rules of the game. Now, we understand, and I'm not getting into baseball, but they had to make amendments like pine tar, different things, uh, files so they can you know score the ball up a little more. They've had to make rules, but it, is, it has stayed the same. Where do we get when we have a bunch of people who do not know who they are, do not have their identity, do not have a foundation, that we suddenly start changing the fundamental parts and, uh, of the Word of God to fit our identity, right. to, make, to make it work for us? Instead of us adhering to what God said, we now start changing what he said to, to fit to us. And then anybody who doesn't agree with that, they're wrong, even if they're doctrinally correct in the Word of God because it doesn't fit who we are. Mm. That happens a lot. <laughs> it happens a lot in our culture. Uh, we have a very self, we have a gospel of self, a self-centric gospel. We're the center of, we're the focal point of the gospel that's being preached now. You have hopes, dreams, ambitions, fears, and God wants to help you in your life's journey achieve everything that you can be. You are the hero. You are the, the protagonist. And everything is centered around me. And that's the identity that we have given people that God wants to make you awesome. You're already awesome, mind you. He wants to make you awesomer. He wants to make you awesomer. Jesus is your personal Anthony Robbins. Amen. He wants to give you everything that you already want. He doesn't want no. to change your desires because no. your desires are already good. He wants everything that you already look for. And so obviously that's when put like that, it becomes obvious. That's not the point of the gospel. The point of the gospel is Jesus. He is the fulfillment of everything. He is the point. He is the hero, the main character, the plot, the everything about the story. And we've got to figure out how do we get into his program? Not how do, how do we, how can we decide we're going to do Jesus a favor by letting him into ours. Yeah. But it, I honestly don't know how I got on that rant. Whatever you said triggered it, but like this folk, the self-focused narcissistic gospel where we have a false identity based on a false understanding of the word of God and how we relate to it. When you don't have a foundational direction or a mentor and, and, I, and, I, and here's where this is my three cents. If you were new to church, you're looking for a church, maybe you've been in church your whole life. And I, I don't I, I, I use the word church loosely. If you are in a position to where you want to start relationship and a covenant with God, okay? Your pastor, wherever you're at, I don't care how nice he seems and how good he seems, and he can be like like you know, melted butter over a hot potato. He can just be smooth as smooth can be. Your pastor's still fighting a battle. Mm -hmm. He's still fighting to make heaven his home just as you are. He's still fighting his own his own inner. And people come in thinking, oh, well, the pastor has everything together, everything right, all the answers. He never is faced with the things that I'm faced with. He never, he never sins. He never gets angry. He I've actually had people tell me, pastors don't get mad. I'm like, where where did you come up with this? But you ready? That is coming from an un- It's like this. Nobody goes to their heart surgeon right before an open heart surgery and he's explaining things to you and you start correcting him and tell him he's wrong and he doesn't know what he's doing and he's done thousands of them. It doesn't work that way in the church community. You can have people who have never opened the Bible, never prayed, show up to a church and have somebody with 50 years of experience speaking and he's an idiot. He's a fool. I got it all figured out. That's human nature right there. I'm guilty of my, in my past. Hopefully not in my present, but I definitely was in my past. And that is where you will, that's the litmus test of where you're at in your life. If you can sit knowing that I am sitting in a position where somebody's teaching me something that I need to submit my life to, well, we don't like to submit. We don't like it at all. So we start, well, they're a fool. They're this. And it's like, okay, well, how much experience do you have with God? Well, I don't. How much of God's word have you read? That's just a book. Oh, well, man, you've got it all figured out. But guess what, buddy? You, you've you read every stat for every baseball team. You know every player. You know every alcohol content and every beer there is, what percentage. You know all this different stuff because that's what's important to you. God's not important to you. 
So do us a favor. Shut your damn mouth. And every time you think you have the answer on what God is, just keep your mouth shut because you don't know him. But if I need to know about beer and I need to know about baseball, I'll come to you. Right. I'm off right. my soapbox. <laughs> no, I, I I get it. It's it's frustrating to have people that have never – I think I think one of the things that triggers me is – people who who are former Christians, okay? So uh, they've given it a shot for a minute. They've come to like three church services, and then you see them a, a, a year later, and they're like, yeah, I tried out that Christianity thing. There's nothing to it. It's all false. All religions are the same, and yeah, it, it's just a bunch of hocus pocus. Okay, you were there three times. You never cracked the book once, but you're going to pronounce that all of all the believers throughout all of history, we're a bunch of idiots because you've never bothered to look into even a fraction of what we have spent our time doing, but you're going to pronounce it just because you had three church experiences. Yeah, I know and, everything I need to know. And that that normally, in my experience, comes from men. Very few women I've ever met that way. It's normally men, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna. I, I'm a man. I can say it. It's normally jackass men. It's men who don't want to be the father in their homes. They don't want to be a husband. They don't want to be held accountable. They want to sit on a bar stool with their buddies all the time and drink beer. They don't want to be the man they're supposed to be. So everybody else is stupid, and what I'm doing is right. Right. Yeah, and y- yeah, I think you're touching on something big there. I think it's because they don't want to have to come to that point of true repentance, and that's what following Jesus requires. At some point, you're either going to like he's either going to be Lord of all or he's not going to be Lord at all. At some point, you're going to come to some issue in your life that you're going to say, I submit this to the authority, the kingship, the rule of Jesus, or I'm not. And I think there are a lot of prideful men struggle, I think, with pride. Uh, I think I can generalize. Not me. (laughs) And, you know, I don't think that they... I don't think that they want to ever submit every area of their life to the Lordship of Jesus. Now... What they do want to think of is they they're a, a you know they're masculine qualities right. There's a lot of us that still believe in traditionally masculine roles. What is that to provide, to protect, you know, to lead? Misogynist. And so they want, <laughs> well, I'm, yeah, but that's what I'm. That's what we are accused of for sure. But whether it's from a, a male female perspective or you know, I think even more with their children, men want to believe that they are a provider and above all a protector for their, for their children. Like nobody better lay a hand on my kid or they'll receive the wrath. Great. I'm all for that. I applaud that mentality. Somebody that doesn't want to defend their wife and kids to, to the death, you know, there's something wrong with them. And what I think people are, it, it just, I don't see how they don't see it. You're concerned about their physical well being about making sure there's food on the table, making sure that they're safe from all kinds of dangers and predators and everything else. But you don't care about their soul. You don't care about where they spend eternity. And people would rather, as you're saying, they'd rather slip into the oblivion of losing themselves in nothingness, of sports trivia, of drinking beer, of going on golfing trips, fishing trips, whatever, all the things that we use to distract ourselves, to self-medicate, to numb our minds from reality, while they're overlooking so many things. I don't have kids, so I don't know if I'm qualified to say this or to make this criticism, but there's so many parents out there that are men, masculine dads, that are shirking their responsibilities. How can you not prioritize their soul? Their spiritual well-being has to come first if you care about your kids at all. But we overlook that. You know, because it, I don't know why we overlook it, to be honest. I was going to say something, but I don't know how to finish that sentence. Why do we overlook it? Why do we excuse men and praise them for caring about their physical well-being, but then, yeah, you're just being, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer is. Quite simply, maybe, maybe the thought of, uh, to some men, not all men, but maybe to the majority of them, that... Um, Pouring yourself into something, becoming accountable to something, and humbling yourself may kind of seem like a sissy move. <laughs> like, I don't need anybody. I got it all figured out. And right. that's self-sufficiency. self-sufficiency. And that's the problem that, that we deal with, man, was when we think we have it right. But how do, we, how do we know if we have it right or not? We typically, 
we're really good at lying to ourselves and others. We, I, I genuinely think the majority of the time we know what we're doing. Certain things we do that are, that are, see that, yeah. but we know the majority of the time what we were doing, you know, um, you know, there are, there's been instances in my life that I've done something. I'm like, Oh dang, no, that's not what I meant. Like, you know, and it's, it's hard to, to have a, uh, a cookie cutter response to everything because everybody is, is so different. People receive differently. People, um, teach differently. And I, I'm going to use this analogy and I've used it several times before I was speaking with, uh, Joe Morris. And, um, I said, Joe, I said, I have dealt with thousands of people that go to church. I've done funeral. I've done hundreds of funerals for people that go to church. And I've done probably a hundred f- funerals for people who don't go to church. And here's the amazing thing. Let's just say God's fake. Let's say it's all made up. Let's say it's just a pipe dream. The thing that gets me of all the people I've dealt with that were true grounded believers didn't mean they didn't cry. Didn't mean they didn't have their response to the tragedy was two completely different types of responses. So the people that have faith, the people that have a, a relationship with God had way more peace, way more comforted than the people that didn't. Sure. And when you begin to look at things, people are chasing, chasing peace. Mm -hmm. We can't lie to ourselves. It's like people who say, well, I like the taste of beer. Okay. Well, good for you. But you drank 17 of them. Well, yeah. Well, do you like the taste of milk? Have you ever sat down and drank 17 glasses (laughs) of milk? Yeah. Milk's a bad choice. Dr. Pepper. (laughs) Right, I like right. Dr. Pepper's. I'm not going to drink 17 of them in one night. Right. We got to come to grips and be honest with with who we are. Mm-hmm. And here's the deal. God does not like somebody who is not sober-minded. The, the Bible is very clear about that. Sure. Yeah, and of course. Be, becoming a drunkard is somebody who's not so sober-minded. Right. If you become somebody else when you drink and you are doing things that you wouldn't normally do, in, in acts of stupidity, you're not being sober minded. You're being a fool. And if we took alcohol out of the mix, that is one of the biggest reasons people don't come to church. People, well, I drink. Oh, okay. Well, what did that have to do with me inviting you to church? Like I'm, you know, I was just inviting you to church. Here's, here's the other thing too. Inviting people to church. People can tell when you're doing it because you want to grow your church or you care about their soul. Right. That people, People are are smart, mm-hmm. and if we are really wanting to get in the realm of helping people, I don't care where you go, as long as you're getting sound teaching and right. doctrine. It's it's not about you got to be with us. Right? Where did it? Where did this Christian experience? Where do we? Where do we get the idea that every, the solution to everything is? Oh, you should come to church with me. Instead of hey, you're struggling with something right now. Well, let, let's say a prayer right now. Do you mind if I pray with you? You know, or sharing an experience, an anecdote from your past, some, some way that God has healed you. So, Hey brother, have faith. Hey sister, have faith that God can see you through this. Cause I know he did it for me. Let's, let's say a prayer or, or the process of what we used to call witnessing. It's not about like just giving a, a canned speech, but like just saying, man, there's a solution to what you're going through. I'm a living witness. I'm a living, uh, testifier testimony that man, you, you can make it, not on your own, but but because of Jesus. And I'm right here with you. You're not alone in this thing. And so we just like, well, that's the preacher's job. The preacher's job is to get them saved and, and, and to tell them about Jesus. You know, I, 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 you just come to church with me. No, be there, be there Jesus that they need right there. We're supposed to carry God's spirit with us, right? We're supposed to carry his presence. So be there. Release the kingdom into their life. Show them what the power of God is all about through the peace, through the wisdom, through the healing, through the whatever it may be that they're specifically needing. Don't give it to the the pastor to do. Be who they need. That's what we're, in my opinion, that's what we're all called to to do and to be. Just be real. Help people. You know, give them Jesus because Jesus is the only thing that's going to help them. And if you are only putting the job on the pastor, you are now creating a nightmare for the pastor because now he's got to become all things to right. all people all the time. I explained this to somebody the other day and I think they caught what I was saying. 
they shared a story with me about something that happened. I said, listen, when I'm, when I'm here at the church, I'm in the, I'm in the office of a minister. But if you see me at the grocery store and my daughter and I are grocery shopping and you want to come up to me, depending on what it is, because people that I hate that we have to put disclaimers out there because people have gotten so unintelligent. They go to the far extreme for everything. So I just said, when you see me at the grocery store, I'm in the office of a father and a provider. So you may come up and be like, hey, in Hebrews 4 it says, and I may just look at you and be like, hey, not not, not right now. But well, you don't love Jesus. You don't love people if you're th- not. That is what's happened. Yeah, right. And you, you create that downfall for the pastors of your church because they are not in that role and they were never meant to. We've created pastors are there to be spiritual guidance, to teach the word of God, and to be there for the body. We've turned it into, well, pastor needs to be at my kids' baseball games and basketball games, and he needs to be there and anytime I'm sick, and he needs to have socials, and he needs to come to have dinner with me, and he needs to do all. We've created all of this stuff of what pastors are supposed to do that you can't find doctrinally in the Word of God right. when he's just supposed to be an overseer of the flock. And there's going to be times where you're going to call your pastor, and he may be in, in an argument with his spouse. They may be in a disagreement. <gasps> Pastors don't have, Yes, they do. Guess what? You call him right then. He's not in the office of a pastor. He's in the office of a husband. And if he has any man worth his salt, he's going to say, hey, my wife and I, we, we are in the middle of discussion right now. I'll, I'll have to get back with you. Because his family trumps you. His family. Ideally. Yeah. Ideally. It, it, it better. It, it better be. Or... His kids, there's going to be resentment. His spouse, there's going to be resentment. His walk is is, is uh, significantly going to be hindered because when you put yourself in a role that you were never supposed to be, you are taking on uh, things that you were never supposed to carry. Yeah. So understand, your ministers and your church, they are fulfilling a, a a an office when they're there, just like the priest. If you want to go all the way back to the Old Testament, when they left, they took their priestly robe off and they hung it up and they left and went home to their families and they took care of their families. But we have become to everything's about me. So if I call the pastor and, and, and he has a vacation planned and he's about to leave to go on vacation, he should stop his vacation because I need him. Right. No, maybe you need to become a, a, a grown up Christian and realize your pastor's prayers aren't heard more by God than you want your prayers. Your pastor's hands don't have more healing in them that your hands have sure, on them. Yeah. And, and, but so now taking it to the full extreme, somebody hear that and be like, well, they don't care for people and they don't want to help people. That's not what's being said. One star Yelp review. Yes, yeah, exactly. I would not recommend. He didn't cater to my every need. He didn't cater to my every need. And the the longer that I have been in a minister's home, the longer I've gotten into ministry, the less I have become about people and the more I've become about God. Yeah. And the more I become about God, the more it becomes about people and the more long-suffering I get, the more empathy I get, the more compassion I get. But if I have to constantly be in a, in a realm that it's not possible for me to be in, I can't, I can't uh, intelligently help people. I can't. I can't help you out because I'm, I'm, I'm fulfilling an office. I have no right doing. And well, I think people lose sight. And unfortunately there's a lot of well-meaning, sincere, good hearted pastors who feel this pressure from our modern church culture or just culture at large. And it's not biblical, but they feel like if they don't live up to that expectation, then they're not doing God's work and they're not doing it. And they're sincerely like trying their hardest. And they think that if they're not on call 24 seven, then they're just not committed to the work of ministry. And I just don't see a biblical precedent for that. I, I see that our family is our first ministry. Yes. Don't tell me that you can, well, I mean, Paul even lists as a qualification for an overseer or an elder. If you can't rule your house well, how are you going to rule the house of God? And so if you don't prioritize your own covenant partner, you made a covenant with your wife. If you do not put her first, even over your kids, and that's another rant that I could go on. Our society thinks the kids come first. No, you made a covenant before God, with God, to your spouse. And so if a, if a man of God doesn't prioritize his wife and his family, that's his first ministry. That's his first priority in life. How can you? How are you qualified to do that? But we've got it so twisted, and they think they have to feed into this culture of, narcissism it's it's 
narcissism under the guise of ministry. And if and, and they just cannot live up to it. And their families suffer, their 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 lives suffer, their health suffers because they think that they have to be Jesus. Well, no, our job is to facilitate a meeting with Jesus. That's what the priesthood was always about. It's what our role is now. It's to take this message of reconciliation to connect man with God. We we help provide that mechanism. We can't be Jesus to people. We're not their Jesus. We point them to Jesus. And a lot of people aren't interested in Jesus. They're just interested in the stuff. Yeah. They're the bless me, feed me, heal me crowd. They're the multitudes that Jesus spoke to, the 5,000. But how many wanted to go home with him and follow him past the when the bread and fish ran out? How many people, once the healing service was over, how many of them wanted to stick around and become his true disciple? And, you know, I think, uh, I don't know how we started talking about the minister side of this but like for ministers that that are in this rut this this vicious cycle of thinking they got to be jesus man they're never gonna they're never gonna make it no they're either gonna burn out they're gonna get frustrated or you know they're gonna have to come to a place where they see things biblically that the people that want you to be jesus they're they're not going to be helped because they don't want actual jesus they just want the stuff that that you can do for them i want the fluff i want i want the goosebumps I want the uh, pretty music, yep. and I want it all done in 45 minutes so I can go paint my face and sit in front of the TV right. and yell at uh, whoever's playing football. And yes. don't get me wrong. I love football, too. I love baseball. I go to well, I don't go to football games, but I go to baseball games. When we have nothing to give, when we have nothing to give, that is the time when we sit back and realize, if I have nothing to give – I'm finding in life that means I didn't receive anything. And what I mean is if I'm not able to give my kids, people, direction, that means, A, I didn't either listen to the people that were giving me direction in life or I didn't have I didn't have somebody. Right. And I've ran into that a lot of times. So we, we had to deal with the high school and some of the kids we work with. I mean, Sean, there were, there were boys in there that were 16, 17 years old who didn't know how to hold a hammer. It never didn't even know how to start a lawnmower. And I'm like, what? I mean, oblivious to anything when it, when it comes to, uh, um, life. Uh, we were at this lady's house and she's having problems with her water well. So, you know, I, I, I pop off the pot, the, uh, the lid to where the contacts are. And I'm, I had some contact cleaner and one of the kids went to flick, um, there was like some cobwebs and I'm, and I slap, I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, what? And I'm like, that's 220, man. That will kill you. He's like, oh, I didn't know. I'm like, well, you just don't go touching stuff. You don't know what it is, man. You'll die. And then I realized you can't get mad at him, and you can't make fun of him. Well, I made fun of him a little bit. But he just didn't know. Right. He just didn't know. But guess what? And we'll end this, and we'll, we'll take a break. Just because he didn't know didn't mean that 220 wouldn't have killed him dead That's in the door now. Just because he didn't know. That's a very good point. And there's a lot of things in life. Being ignorant to them is not bliss. Right. We'll be right back. <laughs> 